So a few weeks ago, I cut up a mattress so it wouldn't take as much space in a dumpster, and I wound up with a bunch of these coil springs in the scrap pile that's going to be recycled. I keep looking at them thinking, well, I wonder if I could do something with this. And blacksmiths were the original recyclers. They would take any amount of steel, any small pieces, and they would go to sometimes great lengths to weld them together and make something useful out of them, especially if it was something that was a, a high carbon steel like these springs obviously are. Um, I don't know exactly what they are, but I suspect that they're probably music wire, which is usually somewhere in that 1080, 1084 type of simple high carbon steels. And I'm binding them all together with some um, hose clamps. Let's see if we can get it to a usable size and shape to where we can get it in the forge and, and weld it up. Yeah, this looks like a terrible idea. I don't think this is going to work because it's too long and thin, so I think I'm going to cut it in half and try bundling it all up in a shorter piece about eight and a half inches long and quite a bit thicker than this. The fact that cutting it all apart again and then rebinding it together and making a shorter, fatter bundle of steel here. Now there's no real good reason for anybody to do this nowadays because obviously I could just buy good high carbon steel in a bar stock and make a knife directly out of it exactly like I would want it to be. But this is going to be more of a can I do it, can I do I have the skills to do it type of thing. And it's going to provide a piece of steel that'll be, it'll have properties that you wouldn't see in modern steel. It's going to be more like a wrought iron sort of look, or at least that kind of odd way that wrought iron would corrode over time once I etch it. So I'm trying to twist it a little bit tighter to get it all to weld together a little bit better. There's a few pieces that are kind of flying out and are never really going to stick on this. A little bit more prep could have probably made a big difference on that. Um, getting it all welded together at the ends a little bit better. Twisting it tighter to start with. Um, just planning how I was going to hold it to twist it. And also um, some rounding dies, some round hole dies for the press would have probably made a big difference. Would have pressed it more evenly. Or I could have um, used a swage block, which I don't have as well. So better tooling could have probably made this a lot easier to do. But about this point is when I started to realize that I might actually be able to get something solid out of this. Before this, it just seemed like I was making some really unusual looking scrap metal. And when it's up on edge like this, and you give it a, a bit of a squish, that's when you can really tell if you're managing to get stuff to stick together or not. Because if it's going to come apart, it usually does right then and there. And as I said before, I've got a few pieces on the edge that are not welding in very well. But everything else seems to be welding up pretty tight. And you can see that the bar is cooling in a fairly even it's not a bunch of lines, which would show that there was a bunch of springs that weren't welded together. And I wind up drowning this out a lot thinner and narrower than I really wanted to.
should have probably stopped way before this. But instead, I just kind of kept going to try and get it to weld a little bit tighter and a little bit better. And kept working at it and wound up with a piece about three quarters of an inch wide. And about twice as long as I really wanted it to be. But that should be just fine for what I'm planning on making out of it. Just flattening everything out, straightening it up. And this is the mess that I wound up with. You can see those few that's sticking out on the side that didn't quite weld in. When I brushed it, they really flared out some there. So we're going to grind all that away. Grind down until we hit solid steel along those sides. And cut the ends off where I'm sure it's not welded. And then we're going to go ahead and try and make a small knife out of this. It should be good high carbon steel. It should hold an edge great, hard and well. So I'm going to start with a point on it. And what I'm going to make is something similar to a blacksmith's knife is what they were called. It was an all metal construction with a um, curled loop per handle instead of some sort of handle scales on it. Historically, blacksmiths didn't usually finish knives. Uh, most often a village blacksmith would make a blade and he would hand it off to someone else who was a woodworker or if they were a larger city somebody that specialized in was a cutler to actually do the fit and finish work and do the handle and guard or whatever on it so it was common for frontier blacksmiths to make knives like this out of all steel construction that they would use or that people in their community would buy from them and use because they didn't really have all the abilities that we do today to finish and handle all the tools and materials and so on that make it so much easier, like epoxy. Uh, and, of course, the woodworking equipment and so on. At that time, since they didn't have epoxies, you had to fit a handle pretty much exactly and rivet it in place. And that was much trickier to do with the tools the blacksmith had. Some of them did, obviously. There's always those that pick up extra skills. But your average person, your average village blacksmith, didn't take the time to do it. And so they just made something a little simpler. I've got sort of a blade shape in there, and I'm starting to draw out what will be the handle. The tang will be a big, long, thin tang that's going to be then curled back around and looped. I do roughly have some bevels forged in as well. I'm really happy at this point that it's not coming apart. I was kind of half expecting as I started to forge it all the time that something was going to just fly apart on it. But it seems like all the welds are holding really well. And you can see the steel cools evenly as it cools. That's always a great sign that everything is one solid piece.
every time you hit it, it seems like something changes shape or size, moves around from gravity or momentum, inertia. So there's constantly some straightening that needs to be done. You hit it somewhere on the tang and the blade that's hanging off the edge of the anvil moves. I'm doing a little bit more clean up on the blade. A little more straightening, trying to draw it out just a little bit thinner at the end. Improve the shape of it. And back to more drawing out the tang now that I'm holding it by the blade. Next we'll be cutting off some of the excess and for that we're just going to use a, a cut off already here on the, the anvil. Obviously there's a lot of ways you can do that. When the steel has been normalized you can cut it with a saw, you can go ahead and cut it with a angle grinder, a cut off disc. But it's really nice and quick and easy to just cut it here at the end. You don't want to cut all the way through. You want to cut most of the way and then bend it back and forth a few times. And then you'll be able to just break it right off the edge of the anvil. I did learn years ago from a smith that when you're not using a cutoff and you go to do much anything else, you should probably pull it out. That's why I pulled it off out of the hardy hole there and laid it on the anvil face. The explanation I heard was that you're not always paying attention to where your fingers are. You're paying attention to where the hammer's hitting the steel. And if you happen to have your fingers get ta caught between a hammer handle and a hardy, there's a good chance you could lose one of them. I don't know if that's true or not, but you could definitely get hurt pretty bad. So I like to try and keep as much of my blood on the inside as I can. This is just kind of evening it all up a little bit, sort of leaving it as a rounded, flat sort of shape instead of the straight square that it was. And as I get closer to the, the final shape, I want to be sure to brush it. gets the excess scale off of it so you're not forging the scale into it. I don't want it to be particularly finished. I want it to look like a rough, again, frontier made knife. Um, so I don't want a real perfect, smooth forged finish, which I'm not sure I'm good enough to achieve anyway, so this is a good project. Kind of start the shaping a little bit there at the horn.
start shaping down where the end of the handle is going to be. We'll actually curve it down away from the blade, you know, on the side of, towards the spine of the blade. And then when we go to bend the handle, that'll wrap around. I'm just going to use a bending jig to do so. And there's going to be some straightening and moving and twisting to get this all exactly where I want it. But then that end will come down and forge something similar to a guard on the handle. I'm just going to use a pair of tongs to kind of change that bend a little bit. I do wind up not liking the way that this turned out and coming back and doing it again, but I didn't actually get any footage of that. I wound up closing up that, that end and bringing the guard part down more closer to the blade. I felt it just made it too awkward to get the cutting edge towards anything you were trying to cut with that thing sticking out as much as it was. And this is the inevitable little bits of straightening because as I said every time you hit it it's one place it seems like it moves somewhere else any place it's hanging off the anvil it wants to drop or move with the inertia of the hit then it's to the grinder and that's going to be just a little while of profiling and cleaning up the bevels straightening them out and getting the, the bevels to it's a little thick right now but not much Get them pulled down all the way from the, the spine to the edge in a nice flat grind. You don't want to bring it entirely to an edge though. You want to leave a little bit of thickness on that edge. So that it doesn't crack when you heat treat it. And I took it to uh, 120 grit, I believe, before I went ahead for the heat treat. I actually normalized it twice and didn't film those. That's pretty much just heating it up above the transition temperature and letting it cool down until it's not glowing anymore. But it turned out fairly straight. It turned out hardened blade. Just as I expected, it was a real easy to steal to heat treat. Some of them take very precise temperatures and time changes in temperature, but this stuff is just get it above non-magnetic a little bit and throw it in some vegetable oil and it, clean, it hardened right up. So in a quick recap, we started with about 25 of these mattress coil springs, bound them together and in a somewhat surprising turn of events, managed to make a solid piece of steel that I got this uh, blacksmith's knife made out of. So you can actually, I'm not sure if the camera is going to pick it up easily or not, but I etched it enough that you can see lines in the blade where the uh, springs were welded together. And I did go back to the forge and reshape the guard part of it here to make it a little bit more graceful and reshape the handle and then of course I had to retreat heat treat the whole thing but it turned out fairly well um, kind of a roach belly blade like would have been common in the 18th century um, which is more than likely what this knife is going to be used for is reenacting in colonial reenactments so that's a very good shape for it. it would have been a common sort of kitchen knife for the time period as always if this video was entertaining or helpful for you 
be sure to like or subscribe to the channel, and that can always help us out so other people can find it too. Thank you.